fascinating thing. There have been some artists who have played around with it. Notably, uh, uh, Vasily Kandinsky tried to come up with the uh, abstract painting um, kind of uh, lexicon where he was a synesthete. Uh, so he really, um, when he um, heard things, he saw colors. Um, I'm not sure if I'm a synesthete, but I think if I imagine stuff uh, like space, um, I can imagine sound and conversely. Like, it's very close to me. Um, but what I was thinking about was this little uh, Paul Clay, and this actually well, gave me the title of Twitter Machines. This is a little watercolor called Twitter Machine. I just love how, um, if you look at the title, Twitter Machine, and you see this thing, the little handle, these little kind of mechanical birds, I, mean, I really get the sense of like hearing that, like hearing and seeing that motion, hearing like that kind of squeaking. Um, but that, I uh, think, is uh, where those two kind of sensory phenomena uh, are very interlocked. Okay? So I, I've been um, starting messing around with that. Um, I uh, played drums for a long time, um, loved drums, uh, and I still don't even know how important this is. But uh, I love this guy, John Bonham, who's the drummer for Led Zeppelin. He's awesome drummer. He's dead now. Um, but um, he is just this amazingly funky drummer um, who also was great um, in that context because they really pushed the recording of the drums. So it's a very unusual uh, sound. So I was able to find um, a lot of recordings of his drums. Um, and then I sort of just sort of played them, played them, figure out um, uh, simple visualizations that they have um, in audio software. You can see um, uh, you know, frequencies and, and oscillations. Uh, and then just started kind of coding that to see uh, you know, if I could come up with some visualization of those drums, that set, um, and then use that as sculptural material. Um, so a bunch of tests, a bunch of kind of things, um, and uh, looking at that kit, looking spatially, it's a very kind of spatial thing. Uh, the drumming, um, and then um, bringing that system to play that I developed um, into these pieces. Okay. So those are almost like all the pieces of his kit, um, little kind of vignettes of the uh, visualized sort of, uh, acoustic um, uh, signatures. Um, also, they're interactive, so as you approach sort of different kind of light information and uh, kind of tempo patterns that mirror a little bit. But again, I, in the title I said, uh, glittering machine parentheses jump on. I don't know how important, honestly, it is to mm -hmm. jump on. It could be, you know, birds. Um, but I guess that was just talking about this process of like, uh, wow, I, I wanted to translate uh, sound to visual, and I really enjoy listening to his drums. So, uh, and again, these are some of the cymbal crashes, so it's a very different kind of look, a uh, different interaction with them. Um, he, there's a lot of kind of, again, um, I don't know how important it is, but there's a lot of kind of math in here as it relates to um, time signatures and sort of rhythms. But, like, he did great triplets, so there's a lot of triplets on the book. And that's the last picture I'm going to show. But I guess here's the kind of question I'm at with this work is, um, or I guess it's, I, I, need to, I need to reframe the question. I was thinking of this great quote by Einstein. He said when he was trying to solve a problem, he would spend so much of the time on the question, like formulating the question. I think he said 90% of the time is just thinking about how do I ask the question? And then once you get that, then it's almost like the answer um, is there. Like, like the hard work is asking the question. So I see this stuff, the connections. I'm trying it out. I have you know, some exhibitions. This is a little bit of a uh, issue, in a sense, um, with making art, because you have to have exhibitions. Uh, 
that maybe aren't on your schedule. Um, but then it's like, all right, how important is it to uh, you know, know about where that sign is coming from? And how um, much do I really want other people to have the experience of synesthesia? Um, how much do I want them to know about it? Um, but um, so I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is like the opposite of TED Talk, where they're like, and now go save the world. And I'm now I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go and think about the question. <laughs> so, thank you. Which senses have you experimented with in your synesthesia work? Did you ever try mixing music and lighting? Uh, um, the only one I've tried so far is, is listening to something and then um, trying to imagine form. Uh, so that's, that's basically the process. And then in that, um, the research is, um, in my imagination, that's what it looks like. What does it look like? Um, with computer visualization tools. So, I mean, there's so many ways to visualize it, you know. Um, so I'm trying to kind of, you know, match it or see uh, in the system. Yeah. Yep. So I'm watching the question, just watching the I was talking to someone else about it, where we were really, I was talking to a scientist who does some um, our work. Um, and in a way, it would be much easier, I think, if I was a musician, um, and like a musician worked with a scientist. Because there is kind of clear, like, well, you know, you could use scientific principles um, to, and engineering principles, and all the STEM stuff to make an instrument. Those great instruments are made that way. Um, but if you use some scientific principles to make compositions, they probably wouldn't sound that great, or they probably wouldn't move people in such an emotional way. Uh, they, people sometimes mention Schoenberg's 12 system, which is a very clinical scientific system. But I don't know if anyone really enjoys listening to that. It's more of a you know, scientific thing. So, like with music. You know, people will say, well, the, yeah, they don't even ask for the criteria. It's like, well, do you enjoy it? Does it move you? Does it, like, you know, make you want to sort of stand up and dance? Um, maybe poetry, too. Same thing. If poets look at science, you know, they probably get a lot of inspiration because they look to the world. So they look to those questions. But if it was a poem that was, like, an uh, easy way to remember, like, the periodic table, like, is that much of a poem? Probably not. That's more of the science. Um, but with visual arts, there's a confusion um, because visual art is so kind of expansive and greedy and hungry, and we have this tradition of the ready-made, where um, you know Duchamp put a, a urinal in a gallery, and people argued for 50 years as to whether or not that was art. But yes, it's art. I mean, and then then you argue like, well, is it interesting? And they argue for another 50 years. But but that's you know a thing about art um, that is really elusive in a way. And then from the perspective of the science, and here's where I was talking to my friend, um, so often they'll have, um, you know, they'll be sitting at their scope or, um, you know, some uh, medical uh, or scientific procedure, and they'll say, whoa, that is so beautiful. That's incredibly beautiful. That is, uh, has a resemblance to, say, abstract art, abstract, you know, art. Um, and it's true, it's beautiful. Um, and there's probably a lot of um, echoes and, and kind of resonances with it. But is that art? Uh, I, I don't think it's art. Um, I mean, you can call it art. But um, see, that's where it kind of gets a little fudgy, you know? And it's like, yeah, okay, you can call it art, but is it interesting in the context of the history of art and the community of artists making art out of you know, that discursive practice? I'm not sure. But, uh, 
so thinking about this, I don't know, uh, I guess, yeah, it's like a categorical kind of confusion. Yep. Yeah, I wonder if, uh, it's, it's funny, you, you kind of put it in the context of scientists, or applying science to art, but uh, I don't know, my, my, a bunch of folks in my family are both scientists and artists. So uh -huh. I, it, it's, I almost look at it the other way, where like creativity found in art and music was applied to science. Um, and they were able to explore uh, yeah. science with that kind of fun expression and you know, I, I always look at it in the first. Great, yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, there's where I think, maybe I was trying to go with that, that the similarities are so rich um, in terms of the process, in terms of that method. Um, but maybe the biggest difference is like that end part, that end part. Of the verification, uh, but also maybe in use, I don't know, maybe. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's another thing, like etym etymologically, or like science is a new term, I think in 1822, like scientists. Uh, but people did all kinds of things you know, that were like, oh, Leonardo da Vinci did science and did art. I mean, but he never called himself anything. You know, like activity. So this is all uh, kind of people interested in science, people interested in art, and we've done projects, doing projects. Well, it's really, I mean, where you pointed us right at the beginning of the class, out of the course, obviously, but we're really, in this very beginning, looking at what is science, what is art, and part of one of the assignments today was on what is art, which was quite uh, controversial, I think, in some, I mean, it was just, it's, it was a heavy piece of literature about what is art, and what is art, you know, it would be interesting to see what you think of this, it, uh, is it a Stanford definition of